to the Gorilla Report. My name is Ollie Harper and we are back for another instalment of the latest professional wrestling talk show which comes to you every single Friday night here on YouTube.com. Now this week we have got the first part of the Lance Hoyt interview. Former WWE, former TNA, current New Japan Pro Wrestling star Lance Hoyt joins me on the show over Skype for the first part of an absolutely tremendous interview. He's coming up in a little bit. We've also got the WWE news for this week. Of course, talking about everything going on in World Wrestling Entertainment for this week. And also, let's talk about what I've been up to this week. I attended Southside Wrestling Entertainment's Unlucky for Some on last, well, it was actually last Sunday from Stevenage, the, Steve, one of the, the Stevenage Theatre. Absolutely tremendous show, no doubt about it. When the DVD comes out, very much tempted to be picking that one up. It was an absolutely great show. Match of the night for me had to be Davy Richards against El Laguero. Those two tore the house down. El Laguero is a guy that even, I know DJ Hyde put him over in the sit-down interview last week. El Laguero is definitely one of the very best here in the UK. He is doing some absolutely tremendous things. He is having great matches with so many when they have imports come over to the UK. He's putting, he's having some really, really good matches. And of course, he'll be facing Ego Dragon at the uh, third anniversary show in a steel cage match. That is definitely one that I wish I was going to be going up for, but uh, with work commitments, I wasn't able to attend. But uh, to everybody that is going, hope you have a good time because it will definitely be a great match from the way it's been built up all these months. But uh, after this, we have got the WWE news. We'll be back in just a little bit. So it is now the WWE news portion of the show. Uh, we're going to talk about things going on in the WWE for this week. First of all, let's talk about what happened on Monday Night Raw. We have got new tag team champions in Gold Dust and Cody Rhodes. And you know what? I'm very chuffed that the WWE decided to put the belts on the Rhodes brothers. Simple factor is, I think that with Cody and Gold Dust, you know, they're very, very over right now. Gold Dust can still go for the age that that guy is. He is doing absolutely fantastic and him and Cody just work so well in the ring they've been having some of the most really exciting matches against the Shield and you know this feud is going to definitely continue going on into the winter and in terms of you know Gold Dust and Cody you know it's nice you know the fact of the matter is putting the belts on these guys you know it's going to get the fans a lot more invested into them so when they do decide to break them up hopefully we will get our Wrestlemania 30 Rhodes feud you know have Cody versus Gold Dust and in terms of for that, you know, who would you want to go over in that one? Well, for sure, you've got to put gold, gold dust to put Cody Rhodes over to really then elevate Cody Rhodes to the main, the main event status, which he very much rightly uh, deserves. But uh, very much fair dues on the WWE for capitalising on the, uh, you know, on the Rhodes right now and giving them the tag belts. Also, to talk about this week, recently revealed on Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast with Colt Cabana. Colt Cabana has received yet another tryout out with WWE is a announcer for NXT that is going to be in the next couple of weeks so it's going to be very much interesting to see how Mr. Cabana gets on on his next tryout hopefully and I really do hope that uh, WWE does see something with Colt Cabana you know, he's an entertaining guy he does some good stuff and his art you know the art of wrestling is a great show to check out every Thursday on uh, iTunes you know it's a great show to check out but um you know, we'll have to wait and see. And, you know, if Colt Cabana was to receive a commentary job, I think there's definitely something there that could definitely work with. I mean, he's, you know, he's, a, he's a veteran in the business, in the wrestling business, so uh, that he could definitely work it. But uh, other news to also mention this week as well, of course, I didn't really talk about it last week, but, of course, Shawn Michaels will be the special guest referee at Hell in a Cell in the Daniel Bryan-Randy Orton match. I think this has been a really cool little element that they've added to this one. And, it, you know, it's really going to add that sort of suspense. Is, is Shawn going to turn on Daniel Bryan or is Shawn Michaels going to just play it down the uh, play it down the middle? And it's very much, again, like... 
how Shawn Michaels was positioned in the WrestleMania 28 match with Triple H and The Undertaker. And, you know, this same sort of factor brings in here as well. You know, is uh, Shawn going to stay with the guy that he trained in Daniel Bryan? Or is he going to be uh, just, you know, looking out for his boy Triple H and make sure that Randy Orton walks out as the WWE Champion? There's a lot of different, you know, ways that this match could go. And it's going to be very exciting to see how it goes down at Hell in a Cell. But uh, that is all the news this week for WWE News. And when we get back after this, folks, we are going to be doing the first part of the Lance Hoyt interview. Former WWE, former TNA star in the house on the Gorilla Report. He's coming up next. We'll see you in a bit. <laughs> Folks, we are now back on the Gorilla Report, and I am now joined by a gentleman who definitely is world renowned. He has been all over the world. He has been in Japan. He has been in America. Born and raised in the good old state of Texas, I am joined by a gentleman who has competed in TNA, WWE, and of course New Japan Pro Wrestling. Where currently is where you will definitely be able to check this guy out. I am joined by none other than Lance Hoyt. Welcome to the Gorilla Report. Thanks for having me on, man. I truly appreciate it. Not a problem, not a problem. I'm very much humbled that you took the time out of your day to come on the show. Um, yeah. But to say thank you very much. Now let's start Let's start this interview. Let's talk about your early growing up. Now, of course, you grew up in Texas. Now, that is a great place. I've always wanted to check Texas out. Talk me through the whole growing up in Texas. A few things you want to talk about. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's where I was born and raised. It's where my family is from. Um, you know, Texas is an amazing place. It's so big. You know, there's different people from east to west, north to south. Uh, just depending on where you want to be and where you want to go as to what kind of atmosphere you're going to run into in Texas. And, you know, yeah. since I've grown up here, you know, it's it's where my heart is and it's where my heart will stay. Um, you know, wrestling probably wasn't my first love because uh, American football is so huge, yeah. especially in the great state of Texas. And so it was one of those things where through my high school years and even early college, that's what I was focused on was playing American football. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I've, I've always lived here. I live in Dallas, Texas now, and I think this is probably where I'll always stay unless something big comes along and I have a good reason to move. Amen to that. But, uh Say so talking on so very much so very much you weren't the whole wrestling thing really wasn't something at an early age. Uh, what age were you when you first kind of got in, introduced to, introduced to uh, professional wrestling and it was something really that you know you took off as a fan. When what age were you when it you know really first came in for you? You know, it was probably about 16 or 17. I was, uh, you know, Dallas, Texas has a rich history in the wrestling business with the world class and the Paul and Eric family, but I, I didn't grow up around here and I didn't really get to see any wrestling until probably 16 or 17. Uh, I was a huge WCW. Sting was the reason I started watching wrestling. Okay. Um, you know, and so while I was playing football and that was my focus, I had become a huge wrestling fan through my uh, latter high school years and especially going into my early college years. Oh, fantastic. So, say, so too. So WCW, I'm guessing you were watching, of course, the Nitros and the, the Thunders yep. at the time. Um, yep. And so you were drawn very much to the Sting. To, to Sting, what was it? The uh, All American Sting or the Crow Sting? Which one were you really drawn to? As a <laughs> the the Crow Sting, I think that's about yeah. the time that he donned that whole personality when they were running the whole NWO faction, and you know when they were trying to bring him on board and trying to say he'd done it, and he did, and you know yeah. he did the big disappearing act until he started showing up in the uh, the rafters, and you know nobody knew what was going on with Sting, and so that was really kind of when I really started to pay attention. You know that really oh. captured my imagination imagination to say the least oh fantastic fantastic of course i mean i was always a big like stinger fan growing up so i can definitely uh, agree with you on that now of course so talking on to big high in your high school days um, mm -hmm. were you college football you know did you play a lot of uh, american football in your high school days yeah, I was a, a quarterback for my high school football team, and then you know yeah. tried to play uh, a couple years in university when I when I first went in and was studying in university. Tremendous, tremendous. Now, uh, okay, so let's move on a little bit. So, talk about, of course, your early training or getting into the business. Um, <laughs> what age were you when you were like, "This is what I want to do. I want to go out and I want to be a professional wrestler." What age were you when it was it really dawned on you? This well, you know, I was I was probably about 23, 24. I was around the year 2000. Um, you know, I'd, I'd gotten out of playing football. 
Uh, and I, I was still looking for something to do that was athletic. And, you know, again, I'd been drawn into the business as a fan. Um, I was working in a nightclub in Austin, Texas, and the guy who owned the nightclub actually knew a, another guy who had started his own training facility. It was called the Southwest Wrestling Federation. And, you know, he had his own facility with a ring and some weights. And, you know, uh, there was a guy named Solo Faitala there who was my original trainer. And, you know, he invited me out one day to, to come and try out to be a pro wrestler and I'd never been a part of it. I'd only seen it on TV. I only knew what I had seen on television. Um, so I had no idea what I was getting into. And I actually, I had no idea how much pain was involved in (laughs) professional wrestling. And, you know, I went through a, a a generic first day training just to kind of check it out, see how it was. And, you know, I was in, I was in more pain after that one day of pro wrestling training than I'd been my entire American football career. And, uh, you know, I didn't even know if I was going to go back into it, but the guy who owned the school and the federation, uh, made it financially affordable to a, a young broke college kid. So it was, it was that's how I kind of got my start, you know, around 23 or 24. So I kind of got started, I guess, a little late in comparison to some kids who get started in their late or early teens. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, of course, it's nice to know that, uh, you know, even at that age, you know, you went out and you, you grabbed it by the horns and you, you rode it off into the sunset, of course, went on to have <laughs> great success. Well, I'm- I'm hoping my sunset hasn't hit, hasn't uh, oh, no, gone no, all the way down yet. No, you know? no, of course, of course. Um, <laughs> so, saying, talking about your training, um, was there ever a day in your life where you were like, you know, did you ever have doubts in the early days? Was there ever like a day where you were like, you know, is this going to really go for me? Was there ever that sort of doubt ever? You know, I don't remember having any doubts. You know, it was always a, a hard situation. You know, I lived about an hour away from where my training facility was. And I was still in university. So I was trying to balance, you know, my school and, and my new training with pro wrestling together. Yeah. Um, you know, going that hour there, an hour home every day for three, four days a week, and then making sure I got my studies in so that, you know, school was taken care of and stuff like that. Um, so there was never really doubts. It was just always a, a hard balancing act. So, sure. you know, something I really enjoyed doing, like I said, that one day, that first day where I was in all the pain that I was, was the only day that I went, man, do I really want to be a part of this? And it wasn't even a doubt. It was just not a lack of understanding of the business and what it truly entailed. And uh, once I really got into it and started learning how to do more things and be a part of the business, it was, you know, it started to be more fun. And the, uh, the possibilities of getting to perform in front of an audience as a professional wrestler to whatever degree was just it was enticing it was intriguing it was something that I, I really wanted to try and be a part of and so no there weren't any real doubts it was just a, a hard road and you know I worked hard and did what I had to do to, to try to continue to move that forward Tremendous. It's nice, you know that's nice to know you know you, you went out you, know, you, you just went along that road and you know you really paid your dues to, to get to where you you need to get and that's that's very good um right. so let's say talking about your early sort of independence then of course uh, right. professional championship wrestling right um how was this round well how was this one of these first sort of early independent promotions for you really uh, independent uh, you know professional championship wrestling Professional Championship Wrestling, PCW here in the States and in Arlington, Texas was probably the best thing that happened to me, especially in my early days in the business because they ran a weekly program, which not a lot of people do or, or do now, did then, or, you know, ever will do just yeah. because it's so, so hard to run a, a continuous program like that. And they had TV here in Dallas, Texas. So they were actually filming for television, which meant you had to learn to work the cameras and you had to learn to cut promos. Um, you had to show up early to do backstage filming and whatnot. So it wasn't just, you know, a show set up and you went out and wrestled. There was a whole production behind it. So you were learning more than just what, what some guys get to experience. And it was actually uh, a great, great opportunity for myself and many people because it was something a little more, like I said, than just a, a normal independent show set up in a a National Guard Armory, like a lot of them are done here, or high school gymnasium, which a lot are done. And there's nothing wrong with those, but what they were producing, because they had a whole, they took an old movie theater and converted it into their arena, the PCW arena. Um, We had video screens, we had an entrance, we had, you know, barriers, we had the fans set up in specific ways. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. It was a great learning experience. Got to work with a lot of top talent, you know, and everybody from around the state was clamoring to be a part of it just because it was such a good program. Um, and, you know, they ran for about 10 years straight. 
Um, you know, the TV wasn't on TV for 10 years, but it was on for a long time. They always filmed stuff for DVDs. Uh, the crowds were always amazing. Um, you know, so for me, it, it, it holds a special place in my heart. And I think it gave me a leg up on a lot of guys who were just working one show once a month or, you know, maybe they're working a show once a weekend in different places. You know, I had a consistent job and got an opportunity to work on character and developing myself and my skills on a continuous basis. So PCW meant a lot to me. And actually, in December, we're doing a reunion show for PCW, which, you know, we're hoping to get everybody that we can involved that was involved in PCW back then. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Very cool. That's very cool. And that's saying, for such a, you know, early days in your career to really get to experience what, you know the big, you know these bigger companies are doing like say WWE, TNA, of course, <laughs> consistent television broadcasts. You're getting to be a part of that at such a young age. Very, very, right. very, very good. I mean, you're you're at quite an advantage in your career. I'm I'm guessing. You know, you've you you're pretty much like say you got a one up on all these other guys who are only probably wrestling every couple of weeks, whereas you're on every single every week. Um, right. That of course that makes it when you do go somewhere like TNA or WWE. Um, You've got more of that experience for the uh, on your you know on your resume, I would say. For, right, you know. I I believe so as well. You know, it gives you a, a a definite advantage to knowing how to do all the camera work uh, as far yeah. as wrestling is concerned in comparison to just working in front of a live crowd. Fantastic, that is good. Now, um, so let's talk. Say, touch on. Let's move on. Say, talking about TNA, of course. Okay. The TNA, okay, total nonstop action wrestling, mm -hmm. Impact Wrestling. Now. Um, your introduction to TNA, how did it come about? Well, you know, they were in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, they just really taken a hold of the asylum, as they called it, in Nashville at the fairgrounds. Um, you know, uh, my real first opportunity with them came when I did an autograph session in Dallas, Texas, and they had one of the cage girls who, uh, affectionately went by the name Lollipop, who was there, you know, signing autographs and stuff like that. And, you know, we just had started talking and she kind of asked if I'd ever tried to go there and I had a little bit of a story that didn't pan out with them. And so she offered to take a videotape and a picture to somebody within the organization, which turned out to be a guy named Bob Ryder. Okay. Um, and she did. She followed through. She took my tape. She took my picture with my resume information on it. And I think within the next week or two after that happened, you know, I, I, I got an email saying that I could come in for at that time, what they were doing was Explosion was kind of their tryout program where they would take the TNA talent that was already under contract and working with the company, and they would wrestle guys who were coming in from here, there, and everywhere and basically trying to get a job at the time. So um, I had my first opportunity to do that. I ultimately did two actual tryout or explosion matches. I drove myself nine and a half hours to Nashville one time just so they would see my face. Um, and then what was going to be my third tryout match on Explosion ultimately turned into uh, me being uh, put onto the Wednesday night pay-per-view program teaming with Kid Cash. And it came out of nowhere. I had no, I, I had no clue that it was about to happen. Uh, you know, I showed up the day of expecting to just work Explosion. Yeah. And my name was on the actual uh, wow. Wednesday night pay-per-view board with Kid Cash. And yeah. so it was a really cool kind of experience. And that's kind of how I got my start with TNA. Wow, so saying it's, it's touching on, it's quite funny, a lot of wrestlers that I've spoke to in the past have always said that sort of like, when it's unpredictable and it's just that sort of where, once you feel like it happens by accident, it, they're the best time because then those are, the, those are the opportunities that you really do grab and take and uh, of course you're saying so, of course you went on and you were called Dallas, your ring name was Dallas and of course right. you, you was uh, Kid Cash's bodyguard. Um, so talk, let's talk about Kid Cash, okay, so how, how was the whole, you know, working with Kid Cash, talking about that, how was, how was he? Cash was awesome for me. You know, we yeah. I think we clicked right away. I think he knew that I was coming in and I just wanted to work hard and, and try to earn my place. And, you know, I listened to him a lot, which I think he appreciated it. And he helped me out tremendously in my early part of my time there. Plus, you know, we, we were a good combination. You know, he was the, the high flyer, the guy didn't take no stuff and just, yeah. you know, and I was his big bodyguard, badass, oh, excuse the language. And, you know, I stepped in there and I put him down and then he came yeah. in and rubbed it in their face. And it was a good combination, Kid Cash and I. And yeah. I initially, you know, I found out later that I kind of got that spot because um, another guy who was supposed to be teaming with Cash at the time, uh, his, his wife was having a baby and he couldn't be at the show and they were trying to find somebody to tag with Cash. Yeah. And uh, my name was brought up because somebody mentioned that they thought I was look like a bigger version of him. Yeah. And so that's kind of where that all came about. And, you know, I, I 
I did my part, I'd like to say. And once they put me out there, I, I did well enough. And, you know, I actually got offered a contract the, the first night I worked. And so it was kind of a cool experience, you know, yeah. maybe a little uh, quick trigger to, to go ahead and sign a contract the same night and not have somebody look over the contract. But, yeah, cool. you know, I was just an independent kid trying to get an opportunity on a bigger market and sure. it came along. So I took it. Um, now, of course, um, with Kid Cash, of Kid course, Cash. he obviously would say no in for his, uh, his ECW days. Had you, um, growing up, had growing you seen a lot of Kid Cash in the latter end of ECW when you were still just getting into it as a fan? Are you asking if I'd seen him? Yeah, I mean, yeah. had you, were you quite, you know, were, were you quite known to Kid Cash, obviously, when he was just, you know, doing the ECW thing, when ECW were uh, still around? I, I did not. I, you know, I really didn't even see any ECW product. And, you know, I I was a huge, like I said, WCW mark. Yeah, uh, yeah. Excuse me for using that word. For the longest time, you know, and I, I didn't even start watching the WWF at that time's product until, you know, the infamous, you know, don't change the channel and watch uh, Cactus Jack become champion. And I, I changed the channel like pretty much everybody else in the world did at the same time. Um, you know, and that's when I started watching their product. Um, you know, and when I got into the business is when I started training for wrestling, you know, it was a very different time. Um, so I had not seen really any of ECW, um, at the time. So I, I, you know, no offense to him or anybody that worked their butts off in the ECW at the time. I, I did not know who he was, you know, yeah. I'd known who he was from my few times going to TNA, yeah, yeah. but, um, no, I didn't know anything Fair about enough. him. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, uh, so let's so, talk about, uh, um, so I'm talking about, uh, moving on from the Dallas, what, whose decision was it to, uh, split you guys up? Uh, as far as he and I have been getting yeah. split up, you know, I, it's just one of those business things. Um, there was a time when they kind of put him in a single scenario. They ultimately brought me back and that's when the Dallas name was dropped and I started being Lance Hoyt and we were yeah. tagging again, but then he, you know, Kid Cash is Kid Cash. If anybody knows Kid Cash, he, he does his thing. He's, he's very proud and sometimes he gets himself into a little bit of trouble with companies and he did that with TNA and ultimately TNA and him parted ways. So, uh, it was kind of a forced separation more than anybody making a decision. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, say so moving on from there, of course, you had a quite a good run in the, say singles competitor, of course, still keeping the sort of tag team thing alive. I'm going to touch mm -hmm. on that now, but let's say TNA as a whole, how was really TNA as a whole for you really? You know, when I was there, it was a very different time. I, I don't know how the company necessarily is now because it's been so long since I've been there. But when I was first there, you know, it was the Wednesday night pay-per-views. Um, you know, it was a company that was really growing and trying to find itself. Um, they were really, you know, leaning on a lot of the younger talents, talents that didn't have that national name um, and that were trying to build their own name. You know, I was there when we first went into Orlando and the Impact Zone when uh, we were on Fox Sports Network, you know, in the middle of the afternoon on Fridays. I was there when we didn't have TV at all for three or four months yeah, until yeah. we went on to Spike TV. I was there through a lot of different periods for about five years from 2004 to 2009 with a lot of different experiences from being in tag team with Kid Cash and a part of the, yeah. when NWA was still a part of TNA, yeah. um, you know, to doing more single stuff in the, the quote unquote ho hoitomania days. Um, and then, you know, uh, ultimately finishing up my time at TNA with uh, Jimmy Rave and Christy Remy, uh, Christy Hemi, excuse me, in the Rock and Rave Infection. So, you know, it was a lot of different experiences in a lot of different ways good, bad, and indifferent. Um, you know, I enjoyed every moment that I had and opportunities to be there and be a part of that. So it, you know, it was a, it was a roller coaster as the business always is, but it, you know, it was a good place for me at the time until I left. Yeah, of course. So let's say talking about, say talking about a few other things before I say VKM Voodoo Kin Mafia, of course, you right. were there, uh, you were like a bit like the body for their group, of course, uh, the new age outlaws, I'm just going to say, uh, Billy, right. Billy and, uh, BG James, um, mm -hmm. the, alignment with these guys how did that all really uh, come into play um you know that was just a decision by the 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 people who make those decisions i'm yeah. to say that by the bookers you know okay. and i think it was kind of they were trying to take those two guys who were very very established in the business 
um, very well respected in the business and they were trying to take a younger talent that was still trying to find his way in their company and in the business yeah. and, and give him those legs. You know, it's kind of like uh, the business has always done that. If you look at yeah. evolution when, you know, they had Triple H and Batista and Randy Orton and, and Ric Flair and those guys, and I'm sure you can go throughout the history of the business and you'll find that time and time again. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where that was at. Plus, they already kind of had the storyline in place with Christy Hemme and I, and that was kind of where that kind of helped to, yeah. in, in progression of that. Um, so that's kind of how that came about. I think they were trying to f help me yeah. uh, gain some, some clout in the business, and then they were also trying to continue a storyline that they'd already created. Yeah. And I'm very, saying, of course, when you turned on them, and of course you were then with Christy, the decision to turn you heel... Um, were you quite happy about being turned heel? I mean, of course you've been heel before, but uh, from because you're working a bit of a face and then you're going back to heel, was it something that you were, I would say, dis not going to say disappointed, but were you happy to be uh, changing in terms of from face to heel again? Was it something you know you were quite happy about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know the business is how it is, and sometimes you have to change to progress. Yeah. Um, sometimes change is not good, and sometimes change is is, is regression rather than progression. Yeah. But I think I needed it. I think at the time I'd been doing what I'd been doing for so long without any real success behind it that the fans, although they were still behind me, I think to whatever degree they didn't have any confidence. You know, I mean, this business is entertainment. And, you know, they'll cheer for you, but for only so long and sooner or later, positive things start have to start happening for them to continue to cheer for you, I guess. Yeah. So when you change sometimes and turn bad, turn heel, um, I, th I think it's one of those things that can rekindle people's interest in you and what's going on. And, you know, and I think I needed that at the time. So for me, it was a good change. It was a good opportunity to sure. take what I built and what had been built and turn on it and see if I could get as stronger reaction on the opposite side that I've received when I was a good guy when I was a babyface. Yeah. Now, say so talk say the rock and rave faction now and we all know very uh, very comedic group, very much miss them. <laughs> you, ah, you it was a lot of fun. It was great. I mean of course at the time um, Guitar Hero was quite a big popular thing. Of right. course the Guitar Hero franchise was very big around like that post around that year. Um, right. The, was it something that you, you know, was the writers came to you and they said, you know, we want you to, to do this or that whole rock and rave thing, of course, working with Rave and Hammy. Um, <laughs> do you want to talk, talk me, please, the, the whole build of the rock and rave infection, talk me through. Well, the funny part about that is we, we'd already kind of started tag and we kind of, I think we'd already, we'd already donned the name rock and rave infection. Um, you know, they brought Jimmy in. It was Russo was a big fan of Jimmy Rave, and he wanted to bring him in in the company. He'd already talked to me in a long time before this had all happened that we were going to tag together. You know, we just kind of randomly started tagging together, and Christy was our our mouthpiece and whatnot. And we we didn't really have any direction. And um, I remember I showed up to TV one day. Uh, we were taping, I think, three shows in two days. Um, Glenn Gilberti, Disco Inferno, uh, came running up to us backstage when we got there, and he was like, guys, 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 did you hear what's going on? And we're like, no, what's going on? And it's like, well, you guys are going to be doing a new gimmick today. And we're like, uh, okay, what's going on? And he was like, well, you're on all three shows. You have you know, live mic time. You have backstage interview time. Uh, you have three matches, I think, on all three TVs, and we're like, wow, this is amazing. So what's going on? And then he goes, well, you know the game Guitar Hero? And we all just kind of went, uh, yeah. He goes, yeah, you guys all think you're rock stars, but only because you play rock or uh, a Guitar Hero. And we were just like, oh, my gosh. You know, we, we, we thought it was a nail in the coffin. We thought it was like, oh, my God, you're just going to make us absolute jokes. Which, you know, it was supposed to be kind of a fun, com comedic type gimmick. But, you know, then we said, can we do what we want to do? Can we make this our own? Can we dress how we want to dress? Because right now, how we are is not how we would envision, you know, want to be rock stars being. And they were like, yeah, man, have fun with it. Do what you want with it. And so, you know, we, we did. I think the first set of tapings, because we were unaware of what was going on, we, were, we weren't prepared to, to give them a gimmick other than having guitars in our hands. You know, we did what we could. And, we both wear jeans this, that night and stuff like that. And then um, 
I think we went into the, the next big pay-per-view in Atlanta is where we first really donned the the image that we created for the Rock and Rave Infection. You know, I really kind of took on a whole, you know, tattered jeans, open boots, Slash-esque yeah, type yeah, character. Slash, and, yeah. you know, uh, Jimmy took on kind of the glam rock look, yeah. you know, and then Christy obviously amped up her, her uh, rock chick look yeah. that she had. You know, she's just amazing looking and she really can sing. So it was kind of funny to hear her sing badly in front of everybody. Yeah. And Jimmy playing the, you know, he never knows what town we're in character and me playing the... I've had way too much whiskey before I went out there character. So, you know, it was, it was fun creating that and, and being a part of that. And yeah. even though we were quote unquote heels and bad guys, I think we always got good positive reaction yeah. from the people because we were having fun. So they had fun with it. Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, I know you were saying, seeing it on TV, you know, it was at that time, it was such a, it was just so different. I mean, obviously, we say talking on the whole Guitar Hero, that was out, mm -hmm. and of course, you could really relate the whole Guitar Hero thing. And you guys mm -hmm. were coming out with uh, Guitar Hero PS3 guitars, like, and you yep. got Christy with a, and obviously, had like an Xbox Live mic or something she had around. <laughs> Yeah, like like the first the first show she did, and then we were like, that's just not gonna work, you know. Just just hand us a microphone, and she'll be fine. Yeah, it was just uh, it was great. I mean, you guys were thrown this this gimmick, and you really did make it uh, work for the run that it was given. And I, I can I can only applaud you for that. I mean, fantastic. Um, so talking about say so so we leave from the rock and rave infection. Of course, you guys sort of disbanded, and uh, the. Depart, so take, from pretty much on from that, your mm -hmm. departure from TNA, was it a mm -hmm. release or was it your own decision to leave? Uh, it was kind of both. Okay. Um, you know, I'd already started doing stuff in Japan um, and TNA just, they weren't using the rock and rave really anymore. Yeah. Um, I think we'd come in for spots here and there. They were using Jimmy a little more because they would use him on some of the X Division stuff. Um, and I was actually in Japan working for All Japan back in 2009 when I got an email that I needed to call the office. And so yeah. I did. It, I kind of knew what was going on and I kind of preempted the conversation and was kind of like, all right, do we need to talk about this basically in a release form? And they were like, well, yeah. You know, I think they were kind of surprised that I already knew where it was going. Yeah. And I was like, all right, you know, you guys, if, you, if you're not going to do anything with me and you have no plans for me and you're not going to change your minds on that, um, then it's kind of pointless for me to continue to be under contract, which does me no benefit. Um, so like I said, it was kind of a mutual thing. Um, they did want me to do one last spot with the company with yeah. their gimmick of the uh, off the wagon challenge, basically, you know, where we challenged for the tag titles. Obviously, we won, we became tag champions, but if we lost, we were gone. Yeah. Um, and I was like, that's fine, because in this business, too many times, you don't really get an opportunity to say goodbye to your friends. You know, a lot of times you're there one day, gone the next, and you had no idea that you were leaving. And then you just don't see people that you kind of liked and enjoyed and hung around with and talked to on a daily, weekly basis. And so it was an opportunity for me to go and have a little bit of closure. Um, so yeah. it was a mutual thing. Like I said, I think it was going to go that way one way or another. And I was ready for something new to do because nothing was happening for me there. And say talking on say some of the your some of the guys down there of course Hat Christy uh, Jimmy uh, and other guys you work with like Matt Bentley people like that have you uh, do you still keep in touch with these guys uh, from you know in the current day do you keep in touch with them? Um, most of the people I, I don't ever talk to you know the guys that I still talk to once in a while I, I'll chit chat with Jimmy on uh, you know text messages or you know Facebook or something like that once in a while I still chat with Kid Cash once in a while through messages and whatnot uh, Frankie Gazarian and, and Christopher Daniels you know Christopher Daniels is always checked up checked checked in on me with yeah. what's going on in Japan so it's been real cool that he's always kind of been that way um, you know, uh, so these are the people that I've kind of kept up with. Monty Brown was probably my best friend, still is, and we still talk on almost a, a weekly basis these days. Um, so those are the few people that I still keep in contact with my TNA from yeah. TNA times. Just want to thank Lance Hoyt for coming on the show this week. We've got him all over again next week for part two of this absolutely tremendous interview with the American psycho Lance Hoyt. But uh, that's, I think that's about everything for this week. My name is Ollie Harper. You have been watching The Gorilla Report. Please do keep on watching your professional wrestling. We'll see you very soon, folks.